Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Kendra together. I'm based here in the Cambridge lab, and we've actually got a quite a big global program around cloud computing working with the research community. We call it Azure for Research. And you can see our website and our uh, Twitter, Twitter handle there. Um, so I want to give you a few sort of highlights of uh, what we've been seeing so far. You saw earlier today what we're doing sort of inside the data centers and how MSR is helping with that. And this is more kind of working with the external community, with the, the, the university sort of academic community. Um, but you'll see a lot of these applications that actually do have very much sort of industry relevance as well. So when we think about this idea of discovery um, and we go back and we think about how we actually do that. Uh, then in olden days, um, scientists like here Leonardo da Vinci or Galileo would observe what was happening in nature. So this is a sketch from uh, da Vinci's notes of flow past the river. So he was understanding how you know, eddies form and, and sort of thinking about what those implications were. And so we sort of think of that as a sort of first paradigm of, of scientific discovery. Um, but then how do we take those observations and do useful things with them uh, one of the great sort of gifts that we, we have now is mathematics, uh, and this is the, the Navier-Stokes equations, which actually describe that flow that da Vinci uh, was looking at. Uh, and so that allows us to really sort of drill in a bit like, you know, Jasmine was showing, you know, the beauty of mathematics is that we can actually build models, and that helps our understanding of the world. But sometimes, as with this model... Uh, and this equation, you can't solve it. So there's actually a maths prize um, in order to prove that this model has a unique solution for uh, you know, complex problems. Nobody has actually proved that you can solve this equation and come to a unique solution. However, that doesn't stop us from using that equation to do things such as weather forecasting, climate prediction, designing cars and aircraft. I, um, before I came to Microsoft Research a few years ago, worked at Southampton University and taught aerospace engineering and worked with Formula One teams on how to um, design cars better in the wind tunnel, but also uh, on supercomputers. And so, you know, very much we call that sort of third paradigm of computational science, computational simulation. And we think of that as state of the art. Um, and certainly, like I said, working with Formula One teams, they have these huge clusters and they run you know, these simulations every, every, you know, every hour, of every minute to try and optimize their cars. And, you know, the Met Office is running weather forecasts, you know, that we can see. So that, you know, state-of-the-art supercomputing, we think, is sort of heroic science. But we're moving into this world of what we call data-driven discovery. Uh, and so Jim Gray, who's one of our researchers, um, who was into uh, essentially big data, um, but a long time ago, uh, coined this phrase, the fourth paradigm of uh, data-driven discovery. Uh, and he worked with a lot of different communities. Uh, and what's interesting is if we think about that scientific discovery process or any sort of ex research sort of project, we generally sort of have some sort of idea, hypothesis, a question we're trying to answer. Um, we might, you know, get some data, do some modeling, and then we sort of work with our colleagues to sort of understand that. We might then do some analysis and some data mining, and then typically we'll disseminate and share that in the academic world. That's typically a publication. Uh, and then that goes to a journal and it gets archived so that other people can access it. And so that is essentially the sort of research life cycle. But with this idea of data-driven discovery, a real enabler is if we share the data. Because if we share the data inside our teams, outside our teams, globally, um, you know, as Jasmine said, you know, with a thousand researchers working on C. elegans, doing that sharing, it opens up opportunities for other people to contribute. They can pull the data and do new things with it. Okay, there's a saying sort of within the open data community that says the best phenomenal use of your data is going to be by somebody else. Okay, because they can come and look at it with fresh eyes and say, hey, there's a brand new opportunity here. For companies, that's hopefully going to happen inside your company, but if you pull in data from elsewhere, you can ha you know, really kind of have these step changes in what you can do. And so actually, we published this book, The Fourth Paradigm, actually about five years ago. Uh, and if you read it, it's freely available on the website there. You can download it for your Kindle. There's PDF versions, etc. cetera. Um, those essays around data-driven discovery are so relevant today when we start talking about big data, data science, Internet of Things. Um, when we, we look at that book and read it, uh, I sort of laugh and I cry because, you know, in some ways, brilliant, we've done that. And in others, we've made no progress. So, um, so that's a really interesting read. 
um, to sort of get you to think about that. And Jim, he worked initially with the astronomy community. And he did that because the data's worthless. And what he actually meant was that the data is priceless because it's there and it's free and we all share and we look, in the, look at the heavens and we can enjoy that. But what he meant was there's no tr sort of commercial value. There's no intrinsic commercial value in that data, at least in an immediate sense. So he could look at this without worrying about legal, copyright, you know, licensing issues. And so he could look at it from a more technical basis. And when he worked with the astronomy community and what they were doing, with a project called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was the first sort of digital camera pointed at the sky. So the astronomy community really advanced, developed, you could say almost invented the digital camera in the sense that they built this huge sensor and they did the first digital map of the night sky. And what Jim did is he worked with the team and helped develop the system to make that freely available on the internet. And by doing that, he you know, faced these challenges and when he started working with other communities, um, we'll talk about the environmental science community in a moment. He found that they encountered these same problems. And I think when we go and talk you know, with companies like yourselves, these problems are probably fairly familiar in terms of you know, how do we manage data, how do we describe data, how do we share data, um, how do we create and maintain that data in the long term. Except when Jim wrote this, a petabyte was a big deal. Um, it's not a big deal today. In reality, you know, some of the systems we have are in the you know, hundreds of petabytes. Exabytes now, we're talking about exabytes. You know, think about the Large Hadron Collider, the big new project is a square kilometer array and they're looking at three exabytes of data. So it moves on, the data volumes increase, but actually the, the problems remain. And when we think about that in the context of what we now talk about big data, uh, and you know, Gartner you know, came up with sort of three Vs of data, and we look at that from a scientific context, but actually in your worlds, I think, you know, you might identify with this, the fact that you have, you know, what I call big science here, Large Hadron Collider, Square Kilometer Array, big teams of scientists, thousands, tens of thousands of scientists who work together. They can bring together, build their own systems to manage this problem. Then we have mere mortals down here who sit in their labs, in their offices, with their spreadsheets, you know, out in the field, measuring, counting on their notebooks, uh, and, and they're starting to have to worry about this data problem as sensors become more pervasive. Um, and then the people in the middle, genomics is interesting, financial research is interesting in terms of they sit in the middle, there are opportunities here, but a lot of people sit over here, and how do we actually bridge that gap? And that's where we've been working a lot with the research community, uh, and also, you know, looking at cloud computing and how that can play a role. So if we think about data, um, and Drew will talk about this later on. You know, and we look at the world around us and we go and try and understand the world around us. We go and measure it. Okay, we might go and count birds. We might go and measure um, you know, chlorophyll in, in the oceans. We might fly drones with cameras, satellite data. There's a huge variety of data. How do we actually do anything with that? And that's really a problem that we see in all of the sciences, actually. But I think this picture illustrates it quite well. Um, and the problem is, how do we turn all of those numbers, all of those bits, into something useful and usable? So this information ladder is actually from the sort of hydrology community, where we can we spend a lot of effort managing the data, but turning it into something that's actionable, that we can make decisions about, is the real challenge. And I think when we talk about big data, we talk, when we talk about big data, people often talk about the volume and the size, and that's not really the problem. The problem is how do we get to the top of the ladder? <laughs> And that's where you know, we've been working with the research community on that. Because what's interesting, when we think about data, and I borrowed this slide from Don Syme, who's our F-sharp architect, has been doing a lot of work on, on data with F-sharp type providers, is we're swimming in water. You know, data's everywhere, and we're drowning in, in, in data. Nobody really knows the cost of that. Nobody knows the value of that. Um, Nobody really likes to pay for it, you know, bottled water. You know, we, we can get it out of the tap. Why should we pay for it? Um, we definitely don't know how much water is wasted. Okay, that's a real big problem. Same with data. And then the real problem is you really don't know if you've drunk bad water until it's too late. And it's the same with data. Okay, so, so on that subject and sort of moving on to the cloud, this is a project actually that, that sort of colleagues in Reading did with the Environment Agency. 
Um, and a problem there, again, was around this data aggregation, data dissemination. And so the Environment Agency has river gauges all around the country, uh, and they get updated every 15 minutes, and then that all goes into a predictive model with all the weather models from the Met Office, and then they predict where there's going to be floods in the future. And they had a problem of how do you do that in the time when everybody's hitting your website. Uh, and previously, the Environment Agency, the website, it didn't cope very well with the load. Uh, so we worked with them on the website side, and then with this company, Shoot Hill, worked on how to make this flood data available. So it's called Flood Alerts uh, Openly. And this map is from February, when if you remember, it was quite wet. Uh, and you can see how it does sort of essentially real-time mapping. Interestingly, it was also the government, UK government's first Facebook app. But by leveraging the cloud, they could actually make that available without any fear of it collapsing under the load. This is another project. Uh, this is one that we're supporting under our Azure program uh, with Newcastle University. And it's actually building a flood assessment uh, platform. Uh, it's actually with Scottish Water, still part of the UK. Um, and um, they want to have a system where they can model what they call 100-year events, so events that will happen once in 100 years. And they've done it for Newcastle. This is a model for London. It's a very high-resolution model. It takes in the topography data. It takes in the building footprints. And then critically, they also have a 1D drainage model. So it models the drainage system. And you can see where we get floods. And so they can use this as a planning tool. Uh, but using the cloud, they can do this on demand. They can deliver it into the offices as a web app, essentially. Uh, and it's really allowing them to run lots of simulations very effectively that they couldn't do before on their own system. So there's a, there's a website there on that. So that's a, a really good example where they had this idea. They had the model, which needed quite a lot of grunt to run the model. So that was one part. How do we run the model? But critically, how do we make that available? Just like with the flood alert system, how do we make that available easily? Another project we've done with the um, Irish Marine Institute, where we gave them one of these uh, Azure awards. Uh, to do essentially a data portal, but they've been able to do lots of things. When I talk to people about cloud, and I've just been in Amsterdam at a meeting around research data, talk about two things really, agility and capability. The agility to be able to experiment, deploy very quickly, tear down, and then capability to scale. And so they had a, an urgent operational requirement to de deploy a website. It's a consortium that had some event coming up, and they could immediately deploy their uh, website for the institute. They then had to share a bunch of data uh, so CCAN is a very popular open source platform for, it's used for data.gov.uk and lots of open government data programs. And we have these virtual machines, these Linux virtual machines on Azure. Azure is our cloud, by the way. Um, and uh, they could deploy that CCAN portal, which previously, you know, all the installation steps uh, was, was relatively uh, painful. Um, but they could deploy that very quickly. They could deploy a tool which took some of their data in bespoke formats, put a web front end on it, visualize it very quickly. And then they've also worked with us on a tool we've developed in-house called Fetch Climate that allows you to take lots of different types of, of data, geospatial data, uh, but present it to the user in a very usable way. So here we've got sea surface height, but we have things like air temperature, sea temperature. And rather than querying against the air temperature, University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit data set, which is in a bespoke format that you, know, you need a month to understand that format, extract it, regrid it. We've used Azure on the back end to store that data, but then also do live processing so that the user just has to draw a, a box uh, on the map and say, I want air temperature. 2005 to 2006, every Monday between 12 and 2, and it automatically goes and does that fetch and returns it in a few seconds. So it shows how we've gone up that ladder to turn the data into something truly usable. And we deployed that. We've open sourced the front end for that, and they've managed to pick that up and use it. This is an interesting project at the University of Washington with Patrick McCready um, called Live Ocean, and it's all about oysters. So it turns out that as the oceans become more acidic, oysters find it more difficult to grow their shells. Um, and in, in Washington state, uh, in one of the bays there, it turns out that seven out of 10 oysters in the US come from that bay. Um, but it's really suffering environmentally. And so Patrick's got some funding from the University of uh, uh, from Washington state to build out some tools to help them manage uh, the oyster farms. So really important in terms of sort of economics uh, for the state, but for the whole oyster industry in the US. And what he does is he aggregates lots of data from different sources and run these predictive models, a bit like the Environment Agency. 
um, but sort of slightly bigger models. Uh, and here you can see an animation of some of the results from that model. Now, typically what you would do if you, you know, for scientists is this would be it. You know, we publish it, we put the, you know, AVI WMV file up and that's it and nobody can interrogate it and it's a very sort of, whilst it's interesting because it's animated, it's relatively static in terms of what you can do with it. But Patrick wanted something, Parker wanted something much more interactive and so he worked with us on this um, live ocean system, there we go, um, uh, which is a web, uh, web page. Let's go back. I can see it on there. I'll go back. Um, so it's a web page, basically, which displays this and allows you to query and, again, draw boxes and, and download some of the data sets. And some of the things you can do are things like on-demand computation. So you can draw a box and say, I need a higher resolution simulation of that area. And it will go to the cloud. It will spin up another 100 machines, whatever, run that simulation, return the results, rather than you having to go back, run a Python script, a MATLAB script, you know, fire up the supercomputer, et cetera. It's all done through a web front end. The other interesting thing it can do is... Uh, on-demand particle tracing. So this would be quite useful, for instance, for monitoring oil spills, and you could do that on-demand. And the cloud gives you that scalability which, and the usability uh, for that sort of system. And so, uh, yeah, there we go, it's back. So that's the sort of web page. It's still being developed, but he saw that the, it was a hybrid solution. So he's running the simulation, the main simulation on his local Linux cluster with a couple of hundred cores but using the cloud in order to do the data distribution and then the on-demand post-processing. So it's a very good sort of optimal solution for him uh, to use the cloud. So on that subject as well, one of the things that we've been using, and, and it's a derivative from a Microsoft research project called Worldwide Telescope, is a four-dimensional geospatial mapping tool that allows you to put in longitude, latitude, time, columns of data and hit play and then you can animate on a map, heat maps, bar charts, um, bubble charts uh, and what's great with this tool is it's called Excel. So this is a, a something that came out of our Worldwide Telescope uh, project in MSR that transferred into the office team uh, and it's, it's, it just makes it really easy again for you to do those visualizations and you can point to the cloud so you can point to results coming out of a Hadoop cluster, a SQL database, open data on the web, a JSON endpoint, and then you can aggregate all of that data and your canvas is essentially just Excel. So that was, again, one of the things we did in MSR with Worldwide Telescope and we worked with the Excel team who thought that this was a great way of doing four-dimensional geospatial uh, interrogation of data. So our, our program, um, Agile for Research, um, we've given out these projects awards to about 350 different projects around the world and what we're doing is we're working with the Agile product team to pull together some of that information because we're getting all these fantastic use cases. Like with Parker, that hybrid use case is a really interesting one. Um, and so we're, we're using this uh, program to learn with what people can do with cloud and how we can pull together data, combine it with models and climb up that information ladder. So what next? So our kind of view of the world really is this pyramid. Uh, and again, uh, when I speak to people who work in, in companies, they sort of identify with this pyramid where you have some super high capability systems at the top where you have some sort of gurus and wizards and experts who can use it and, and you can get a lot of great value out of that. Uh, and then you have departments who then build out their own systems. But then you have the majority of your users or researchers out uh, who can't necessarily take advantage of that, but are starting to hit some of these problems on data access, data volume, speed. Uh, and so what, with the cloud, we see it's a good opportunity to not get rid of all of these systems, but be able to combine them in a way that's very, very usable by everyone up and down in this community. Uh, and that's where, again, with our Azure Research Program, we're, we're trying to stimulate that with the academic community. But what you'll see later on today with, with Drew Purvis is how Within MSR, we're actually already here looking at some of these big challenges that we face on the planet today. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you.